Um, so, so uh, Botau uh, has a PhD in statistics from Purdue, and he did a postdoc at Princeton, and uh, has since been uh, in the foundations team at DeepMind. Uh, he's a leading figure in mathematical analysis of candid learning, and also has done a lot of work in reinforcement learning. Um, and he uh, he and Tor Luxemore have had some uh, breakthroughs in analysis of uh, information ratios in reinforcement learning. Um, and I think he'll talk to us today about uh, stuff related to that and uh, about the use of information directed sampling. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Borta. Cool. And uh, thanks, Ben, for the nice introduction. And uh, today is my great pleasure to be here to present some of my work about the uh, information direct sampling. And in this talk, I would like to like uh, discuss and the when and the how to use information direct sampling. So, oh. first of all, let me briefly uh, review what is information direct sampling. I think the idea uh, was invented by uh, Dan and Ben like about like eight years ago. It's a very elegant design principle that explicitly balances the trade-off between information and the regret. So you can view this as a parallel design principle comparing with the optimism-based principle such as UCB or Thompson sampling. So in general, IDS minimize the notion of information ratio. And this information ratio may have like a different uh, variant, but the uh, generic form is the square uh, per step expected regret uh, divided by the information gain about a learning target. So this learning target could be an uh, optimal action, could be the environment, and there could be some like a uh, surrogate environment. It depends on different problems and it's trade off the computation and the regret guarantee. And when I introduce like uh, IDS to some people who are not very familiar with IDS, uh, the first question they raised is like, uh, why should I use IDS? And when should I use IDS? I mean, switch from the UCB or Thomas something to IDS. So for the first part of this talk, I would like to discuss like uh, uh, using a uh, sparse linear bandits as a showcase, like uh, when should I use the IDS design principle? And for the second part of the talk, I will discuss when we extend this to the full reinforcement learning setting, what is the right information ratio to optimize with strong regret guarantee? Because most of the previous study focus on the bandits with fixed action set setting. Okay, so here is the uh, first part. Let's discuss like uh, when can IDS outperform the optimism-based algorithm. So let's consider the very standard stochastic sparse linear bandits. And uh, at each round, the agent choose an action AT from a fixed uh, D-dimensional action set and they receive a reward that has a linear relationship. So here the notion of sparsity can be defined through this S dimension parameter space and uh, S is the sparsity level. So if we consider like a, a Bayesian setting, I mean the prior of the C star is uh, supported on this like a parameter space. And we also consider the standard expected cumulative regret for a banded instance C star as well as a policy pi. And here the X star is the optimal action. So if we want to consider the worst case regret, we will take the supremum over the parameter space. And if, if we want to consider the Bayesian regret, we will take the expectation over the prior of a set star. Okay. So uh, why I'm interested in this like a sparse linear bandits? So first of all, I think it will be of a great practical interest. Because in the recommender system, the feature dimension is very, always very high, and uh, most of the uh, this like uh, uh, features is irrelevant to your reward. And this is the, also the case for supervised learning or high dimensional statistics. And uh, secondly, I feel the minimax property or the minimax rate for this sparse linear bandits is very interesting. It could highlight the necessity to balance the trade-off between information and uh, regret. It could also highlight the power of information direct sampling. Okay, so 
before we step into the uh, minimax lower bound for this problem, let's first define a problem dependent constant for this explorability constant. So this constant, like uh, let P be the phase of the probability measure over the action uh, set. And we define this constant at the C mean. So roughly speaking, we consider the minimum eigenvalue of the expected coerced matrix, and we take the supremum over all the possible policies here. And the, the, the maximum eigen supremum value is this like a C-mean term. So when the C-mean is uh, like a, a dimension three, I mean, independent of the feature dimension D, we see that this action set A but it means a well-conditioned exploratory policy. So here, the exploratory policy is the policy that can attend this like a, a supreme values. Okay, so you can view this is a kind of a assumption for the action set we consider. So why I have this assumption? Just think about like in the supervised learning or high dimensional statistics. If you want your sparse learning, such as Lasso, to work, you have to put some assumption on your design matrix. Usually, you you require your design matrix to be well conditioned. So we must have some like a similar assumptions in the online learning part. And this is like a, the assumption we consider. Otherwise, the sparsity cannot help uh, too much in the online learning scenario for the sparsity linear bands. Okay. And uh, what is the information here? The information is when we pull arms according to this exploratory policy. We will collect information. We will collect well-conditioned data, right? So in the supervised learning, the data is given, and we assume it is well-conditioned. And in the online learning, we assume there exists an exploratory policy such that when we follow this exploratory policy, we can collect well-conditioned data, can collect information. Okay. So uh, any question about this? Okay, so next, uh, then let's have a look at the like uh, uh, minimax lower bound for this problem. And uh, uh, in our uh, New York papers, we prove that for any policy pi, there exists an action set A with a positive C mean and S plus parameter C star such that the regret is lower bounded by the minimum of those two terms. So for the first term, if C mean is dimension three or constant, uh, the first term is a dimension three term, but the dependency on the time horizon is n to the power of two thirds, right? But the second term is screwed to dsn. It still have the polynomial dependency on feature dimension d here. And this like uh, minimax lower bound actually characterizes an uh, interesting phenomenon. That means for different uh, regimes, we may have different uh, behavior for the minimax rate. Let's consider the data poor regime, which means that the feature dimension is larger than the time horizon. I believe this is an interesting regime for high dimensional problems. So like uh, in the data poor regime, actually the first term dominate the minimax lower bound. That means the, uh, the minimax rate can be dimension free, but the dependency on n is worse than screw to the n. And for the data rich regimes, the n is large and even asymptotically, and uh, the minimax rate is screwed to DSN, and both terms is tied. That means that we have a matching upper bound. So this lower bound actually highlights the fact that carefully balancing the trade-off between information and regret is necessary in sparse linear bandits, right? So where does this like uh, enter the power two third come from? So in the hard instance construction, we have some actions which is informative, but uh, it will also occur high regret. So uh, uh, an intelligent agent or smart agent has to carefully balance how many numbers of calls for those informative actions, right? And uh, this n to the power two third is a consequence of optimally balancing this like uh, information and the regret trade-off. So let me ask uh, like a, a natural question: uh, Can the uh, optimism based algorithm optimally balance the information and the regret. And this is our question. And uh, uh, any question regarding this lower bound? 
Okay. Wait, so are you saying that IBS achieves that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Later on. And your, your your question is. Yeah. Is first question uh, I would like to ask: uh, If UCB or Tom something right. can okay. achieve this lower bound. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So it be a max outside, or it should be max of I uh, say a mean of uh, entry bar two third term and a mean of the root end term. Should it be a max, or it could be a mean? Uh, should be the the, the regret is is greater equal a uh, min. I'm asking, should it be a max there? Uh, it's a it's a minimum here. It's a minimum. 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 Okay. okay. So uh, in the same paper, uh, our provider Nifty Mancer, that means like uh, for optimism based algorithm, it fails to optimally balance the information and the regret trade off. So in this, like a data storage in, it will suffer a linear regret lower bound. Right? So uh, in general, the optimism based algorithm will choose an action according to like a first construct uh, constant set and then be greedy within this like uh, optimistic world. So here, like uh, we assume that we, we denote CT as some like a sparsely aware constant set. That means, just think about like a CT is an ellipsoid, but the weight of the ellipsoid is S, the bar T level rather than D here. And this can be constructed by the online to constant set conversion approach, which is coming from the existing world. So our main claim is that for any such like uh, optimism based algorithm, there always exists a sparse linear bandit instance such that in the data core regions, you will suffer a linear regret lower bound here. And uh, although like uh, this is kind of a UCB algorithm, like uh, we believe like uh, it's uh, similar can hold for common something. So what is the reason intuitively? And uh, intuitively is that Optimism algorithm will stop pulling those informative actions as long as it collects enough statistics to prove that those actions is suboptimal. But for a sparse linear bandit problem, it's still worse to pulling to pulling those actions because it provides you much more information about other arms that is not uh, proven to be suboptimal, right? But uh, UCB this like uh, optimism principle cannot. Uh, uh, understand or like uh, utilize this phenomenon. Okay, and uh, okay, now let's have a look at the uh, information direct sampling. I think uh, our answer is uh, positive. So IDS can naturally like uh, uh, utilize this phenomenon and balance the information and the regret trade-off for this very uh, practical problem. Okay, so IDS is going to like uh, take action to minimize the uh, information ratio part. And uh, the third T is the expected single round regret. And IT is the information gain about the optimal action. Here, I didn't talk about computation because like uh, uh, this is just like uh, once you can uh, like uh, have the exact form of the information ratio to optimize. But in practice, once you have the posterior samples, uh, you can approximate this information ratio. Okay, and in this like uh, uh, New York's papers, we proved that the Bayesian regret upper bound of IDS uh, is a minimum of those two terms. So that means for IDS is almost optimal for both the data poor and the data rich regions. Here are some like uh, some of the on S and here also. So this, Result actually highlight the great adaptivity of IDS for this problem because we just need a single uh, algorithm, single policy that can adapt to different information and uh, regret structures. When you, when you region is like a data poor, you will suffer into the power two sir. But when your region is like a, a data rich, uh, you will suffer the euro skirted DSN regret. So this property. Um, will not hold for any optimism based algorithm. And this is the power of information direct sampling. So we believe like a similar phenomenon will hold for other high dimensional uh, bandit problems, such, such as the uh, low rank bandits 
And uh, this is an interesting like uh, future direction. And also for some structure bandwidth problem, if you, for your problem, there exists uh, such like a uh, information regret trade-off, I think uh, like uh, you should consider the information direct sampling rather than the UCB for tongue sampling. Okay. Uh, so uh, any questions so far? So does the algorithm know this delta t? Uh, no, I think uh, this delta t can be estimated by the posterior sample. Because here, like uh, uh, both the uh, C star and the X -T, X -T, X star is the optimal matches, which is a function of C star. And we just need to draw a multiple posterior samples for C star, which is enough to estimate it. OK. Uh, if there is no questions, let's move to the uh, second part of the talk. And uh, what is the right form of information ratio to optimize for full reinforcement learning? So before we step into the full reinforcement learning, let's have a look at a warm-up warm -up example, which is the contextual bandwidth. And uh, let's consider the uh, most basic versions for contextual bandwidth without any generalization. Here, the ST are the ID context from a, a known context distribution. So a straightforward generalization from the fixed action set setting to the contextual setting is to like when a context is arrived or is arriving, uh, you, are, you act as if you are facing a fixed action set, right? And this can be reflected for the definition of this conditional information ratio. That means conditional on the current context the definition of the information ratio is exactly the same for D1 for the fixed action set setting. And actually, this conditional IDS, you just need to find the uh, probability distribution that minimizes this like, uh, uh, information ratio term. That means when you receive a context and uh, you just uh, pretend you are facing a fixed action set setting and do what we did uh, uh, before. And there is another like a uh, like a uh, second choice is this like a uh, contextual IDS. So one limitation for conditional IDS is that it completely ignore the knowledge of the context distribution. And uh, to overcome these difficulties, contextual IDS will take the expectation over the context distribution for both the numerator for the uh, regret term as well as the denominator for the uh, information gain term. Then we can define the marginal information ratio term. And the contextual IDS will actually find the mapping from the context space to the action space, right? I think uh, the difference is, is like, uh, first, uh, the objective uh, is different. One is just need to optimize over uh, probability distribution. Uh, the benefit is like uh, computationally is very efficient and very easy to compute, um, but ignore the context distribution information. And in the next slides, we, we want to show that briefly talk about like uh, for some problem instance, conditional ideas may more richly balance the exploration and the exploitation trade-off because uh, it does not take the context distribution into consideration. Okay, so I think uh, this example is very uh, simple and uh, 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 it's about like uh, why when conditional ideas can enter it for. And in the same paper, we have another example to show conditional ideas may overexplore. So this example is uh, just consider a noise less case. And uh, we have two context sets who arrive with probability one half in a, a ID fashion. So the context set one, uh, you have K actions. One is optimal and uh, another K minus one has regret one. And for the second context set, it has two actions. One is a revealing actions. That means when you pull these actions, it will provide you an observation for all the reward in context at one. And another action, there is no regret. That means like uh, for the second context set, when you pull the revealing actions, like uh, you know everything about context at one, then when context at one is arriving, you suffer no regret. So let's first have a look at how the conditional ideas uh, behave because from the 
design of the conditional IDS is only plan for the current context and completely ignore any unseen context then. So that means like uh, when context set two arrives, conditional IDS will never call this revealing action because this revealing actions will suffer high regret and also provide no useful information for the current context set two, right? And then like uh, it will only pull the like uh, second action in the context set two and suffer like an uh, override regret. A drawback is like, uh, if you ignore the fact that this revealing action could provide a lot of information to the future and same context at one. So that means like uh, when context set one arrives, uh, conditional ideas will suffer okay regret. So overall, it will suffer okay regret. So it's under explore here. And uh, in contrast, how the like uh, contextual ideas behaves, and the contextual ideas will take the context distribution information into consideration. That means it will plan for both context at one and context at two. So that means you could understand that okay, when I pull this like a revealing actions at this moment for context at two, there's no benefit, but for the future and same context one. It will provide you a lot of like a benefit. So overall, like uh, the contextual idea will pull this like a revealing action in context as two, and overall it will just suffer like an O1 regret here. And uh, for this example, it highlights like uh, just for this instance, it highlights the benefit of like uh, contextual ideas over conditional ideas. But this I, I didn't like, illuminate the uh, possibility that. For some class of problem, conditional ideas could be as good as contextual ideas, but we haven't, uh, we do not know like uh, for what problem conditional ideas could be like as good as contextual ideas. Okay, and uh, uh, any question? Sure. Yeah, here we assume we know the distribution of the context, and, and we also could. Uh, estimate this distribution because we assume it's the uh, ID is like a contest arriving in ID fashion. Okay. Uh, so like uh, based on this like uh, intuition uh, for the full reinforcement learning, we want to develop the IDS like uh, based on the versions of contextual IDS. And uh, uh, we consider the most uh, simple and the basic versions of reinforcement learning, which is this finite horizon time inhomogeneous MDP. And the reward is known and deterministic, but the transition uh, pH is unknown and random. And uh, here is the standard definition for the uh, cumulative regret for an algorithm. And L is the numbers of episodes and H is the planning horizon. So this V1 pi E is the value function of policy pi under the environment E here. So the Bayesian regret will take the excitation over the randomness of the environment E here. Okay. Okay. So let's first have a look at the, uh, based on the design of contextual ideas, we have a name for the vanilla ideas for MDP setting. And uh, we first define the information ratio here for a policy pi. And this information ratio, the numerator is a per episode uh, regret. And the denominator is the conditional mutual information between a learning target and the history in the current uh, episode. So this learning target have multiple tries could be the optimal policy, could be the whole environment, and it could be like a, some story data environment that needs less information to learn. And later on, I will specify like uh, what I put here. So for this like a uh, uh, vanilla IDS, it will choose the learning target. So any question for this definition? Okay. So for the vanilla IDS, uh, it will use the learning target to be the whole environment. And uh, at the beginning of the episode, vanilla ideas will compute a stochastic policy and uh, execute this policy for the planning horizon H as the data and use the data to update the posterior. And uh, then we enter into the second episode. 
And this is very similar to uh, PSRL, the posterior sampling for reinforcement learning. And you can view this like a, a model-based like a algorithm at this moment. And again, we didn't talk about computation at this moment. Later on, we will see the computationally efficient algorithm. Okay, so now let's move to the uh, guarantee part. Uh, in this, uh, our uh, uh, newest, uh, newest papers, we have a regret, sublinear regret guarantee for this uh, vanilla IDS. So here is a generic regret bound for vanilla IDS. It consists like, a, I think uh, this is pretty uh, standard, have a form of the worst case information ratio. And also we have uh, another term is the mutual information between the uh, environment, the whole MDP, as well as the entire history. Although like uh, this is a generic bound, like uh, for particular MDP with some structures, we have uh, some non-trivial upper bound for both the two terms. So let's consider the tabular MDP at this moment. For tabular MDP, like uh, we want to have a kind of a prior free, like a Bayesian regret bound. That means it will not depend on the specific prior, for example, like a delicious prior on the uh, transition dynamic. But we have another like uh, assumption for the prior, which we call this like an independent prior across different layers, because we consider a time inhomogeneous MDP. That means for each layer, it has like its own transition, and we assume the prior is of a product prior measure over the whole environment. I think this assumption is kind of like a, a important for the analysis. And we hope to uh, relax this like uh, in the uh, future. Okay. For time functions, when you use uh, age dependence on both curves? Uh, correctly, we, we have the claim, we didn't want to claim we have the tight bound at this moment. You can see, like, uh, it's far from uh, the uh, optimal bound at this moment. Okay. And uh, under this assumption, I, I think we uh, like identify a class of prior, right? And under this, like uh, for this class of prior, we can prove that uh, the information ratio part is bounded by SAHQ. And for the uh, mutual information part, it's bounded by S square root, um, S square AH. So overall, the regret upper bound is screwed S to the power Q, right? You can see this is far from optimal. And I guess the optimal dependency should be screwed to S. So let me show you like uh, uh, what is the room to sharpen this bound. So first of all, if you want to learn the whole transition dynamic, I guess this is too expensive and uh, we are not able to sharpen this like uh, mutual information part because the degree of freedom of this like uh, transition dynamic is S square root A, uh, is S square A. So in the same paper, like uh, uh, we can like, uh, we do not need to like uh, uh, learn the whole transition dynamic. Instead, we just need to learn a kind of a story gate like a transition dynamic and need, need less information to learn. And uh, uh, by use the kind of a risk distortion like a uh, theory, maybe did familiar with that. And uh, we can sharpen this part by um, SAH. So this, in roughly speaking, we do not need to learn the transition dynamic. Instead, instead, we just need to learn the optimal value function, like uh, which the uh, complexity is as a h. This is the way. But you can see, like uh, we still have like uh, one more like uh, s uh, uh, dependency here. Uh, we conjecture like uh, the upper bound of the information ratio should be independent of the state space because for contextual bandit, we can prove that the information ratio is independent of the numbers of contacts. But uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting like uh, uh, future work because all the analysis holds for PSRL as well. As far as I know, for the vanilla PSRL without any variance uh, blow up, we haven't uh, obtained the optimal uh, Bayesian regret bound for PSRL. Okay. Uh, so any questions? And also, like you can see that if you consider, for example, linear MDP, when the state space is like uh, infinite, like uh, learning the uh, whole transition dynamic will not work. This will be infinite. But uh, uh, if you want to use this uh, risk distortion uh, theory, you just need to learn the uh, value function. 
uh, you can handle linear NDP or some other like a uh, uh, function class as well. Okay, so now like uh, let's briefly have a look at the uh, um, proof sketch for this like a uh, uh, vanilla IDS. I think it's not too long and uh, uh, it's not uh, very hard, but uh, there are some like uh, notes here. I I think so. As euro, I think that the major difficulty is to how to bound the information ratio part. And uh, as euro for tabular MDP, we we bound the information ratio of IDS by the information ratio for of the posterior sampling. And uh, first, uh, we need to consider like a, a regret decomposition, and uh, this pi TS is the uh, common sampling, which is that's a PSRL in the MDP literature, uh, in the MDP case. And uh, first, we need to use the mean MDP as a bridge to decompose the regret. What if the mean MDP is like a, uh, at a stage L, at the episode L, you have a posterior distribution for the environment, and you take the mean of the posterior distribution for the MDP, and use this as a bridge to decompose this original like uh, one step regret, one the per, se, per stage regret. And for I1, I2, I mean, the bound is similar. So we just look at the uh, bound, upper bound for I1. And the step, step two is to use standard, like uh, kind of like uh, Bellman and residual decomposition. And we define a value function differences or like a much different name, Bellman arrow. And uh, it looks like this third term. I think uh, just like uh, uh, the differences between this, like uh, S prime from uh, P and S prime from this P, like a uh, uh, under this like a uh, mean MDP term. And uh, the key part is to use the uh, state action occupation factor to do the separation. Here, the, uh, this term, this DH pi star is the state occupation measure of the positive um, pi star under MDP EL bar here, right? I think, I think uh, uh, until there is a little bit standard. And uh, the next step is to use the cauchy schwarz inequality to separate the first term and the second term. And this analysis, you can, if, if you are familiar with the information and theoretical analysis in the bandit settings, you use like a, the probability of the optimal uh, action to do the separation and to use the cauchy schwarz And uh, in the MPP setting, you have to use the state action occupation measure to uh, separate those two terms. So once you use the Curtis Schwarz inequalities and the Pinsker inequalities for uh, the first term of this term can be bounded by screw term S A um, H Q. And uh, for the second term, by using the Pinsker inequality, you have the KL term appearing here. So this KL is between the probability, this like a transition under on environment E and the transition under the mean MDP EL bar here. And uh, there are two like uh, expectations. The first, the first one is taken with respect to SH and H. And the second one is taken with respect to the uh, MDP E and the uh, policy, some something policy here. Okay. And this is kind of like a, a parallel to the standard like the information theoretical analysis. But the key step is to how to uh, establish the relationship between the KL and the information, um, again, the mutual information here. I think this is new, like, uh, and the high, this one heavily rely on the independent prior assumption. Without this, we, we do not know how to establish like uh, this like, uh, uh, relationship here. And the, one of the crucial steps is to use the Linearity of the expectation and the independent uh, prior assumption to show this and to show the last line. You can see the in the left hand side is the probability measure under the sum sampling policy and the posterior sample drawn from the distribution. And the right hand side is the probability measure under sum sampling uh, interacting with the mean MDP. To establish this relationship, you must have the independent prior at this moment. And uh, once you have this, and uh, then you can have the uh, upper bound for the information ratio. This is roughly a very brief like uh, uh, 
uh, proof sketch for the information ratio bound part. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now, like, uh, let's talk about like uh, uh, computation. I think uh, you know. Uh, from my like uh, philosophy, I'd like to argue that that can be really computable. And rather than like uh, just to have like some uh, bond to develop some algorithm. So for this vanilla ideas, uh, let's recap how it uh, computed. So it will optimize this information ratio over a policy space. This policy space is from this like a uh, SH to the action space. So the, the numbers of state is one and the planning of is one is reduced to the bandit case. I think in this paper, it's like uh, it's proved that you only need to traverse over uh, two non-zero component over the action space. This is like uh, um, efficient. However, in the NDP setting, when the planning of is larger than one and the state space is larger than one, you need to traverse, traverse over the policy space. So naively, like uh, I mean, I mean, in the worst case, perhaps, this grows like exponentially in S and H, right? And we haven't, uh, uh, we do not realize any efficient optimization method to solve these optimization problems. And I think in, in the uh, RL settings and in the MDP settings, an efficient algorithm is better to can be solved by dynamic programming, right? Then we may ask a question, can we have a versions of IDS that can be solved by dynamic programming. So at this moment, the ratio form, uh, we cannot, we do not realize at any way to solve it by uh, dynamic programming. Then uh, for this motivation, we consider a uh, regularized version for the information right simply, we call it a uh, regularized idea. That means instead of like uh, solving the ratio form, we consider, uh, uh, regularization form. I think it's just like uh, the first term, I think uh, roughly the uh, denominator. And it's just like a one step per state, like a uh, regret. And then we remove like, uh, the, like uh, the value function for the optimum policy because it's irrelevant. And then we add uh, one more like a tunable parameter lambda here. And this is the standard euro and euro. This is the information gain term, right? So, this is a kind of like a counterpart for the ratio term, but uh, we add one more tunable parameter for the regularization term. Is so, there a square there anywhere? On the bridge? Exactly, yeah, there is no square here, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a key point and uh, why we can solve it by dynamic programming. Okay, okay so let, let me like uh, briefly discuss why I argue this can be solved by dynamic programming. So we define an augmented reward function looks like this way. So this one is the uh, euro reward function, a uh, euro reward function, and uh, add a tunable parameter lambda times the um, KL term. You may see this KL term in the duration of the proof sketch here. So once you have multiple like uh, posterior samples for the transition dynamics, you can compute the this, this EL bar is the posterior mean. You can compute the posterior mean explicitly. That means for this part, actually, you can compute it, right? For any state action pairs. Once we define this augmented reward function, in the paper, we prove that the objective function for this regularized idea actually is equivalent to the cumulative reward under policy pi interacting with the mean MDP here. So this term actually is the value function of the policy pi under MDP EL bar here. So to find a policy that maximizes this objective function is equivalent to find a policy that maximizes this value function, right? So you can see like a, this mean MDP, we can compute it explicitly once you are given like a enough posterior sample as well as this like an augmented reward function. So this can be uh, solved by any dynamic programming solver, such as like a value iteration or policy iteration. Can you still see anything in the virus? Exactly. Yeah, good question. And uh, yeah, okay. So 
We also prove that for this like uh, regularized IDS, you can enjoy the same regret bound as the vanilla IDS I just proved. But you have to carefully uh, choose the tunable parameter lambda here. I think this is very uh, crucial. And uh, because like uh, for the ratio form, the sort of is can automatically adapt to the best lambda. But for the regularization form, a limitation is that you have to carefully choose the lambda here. We have a question in the chat. Sure. Um, how do we compute the KL divergence, which is defined with respect to- Oh, this is a great question. In the next slide, I will show that. Oh. Okay, you know, like a uh, computer KL is still very expensive, right? I think uh, uh, um, a method, I, I think a, a solution that already provided in this paper is to use this very spaced uh, uh, regularization idea. So we will use another like a Pinsker's inequality to lower down the KL divergence term by the variance of this like uh, transition dynamics. And uh, once we use the Pinsker's inequality, we can redefine the augmented reward function in terms of a various term. So this like uh, now our new reward function the standard reward function plus a various term. So this form is very simple now. Once you have the conjugated prior, for example, the deleterious prior on the transition dynamics, you can, this variance also have a closed form solution. And now you can relate it to this, to uh, like uh, many of the uh, previous works. You can view this as an intrinsic reward because like uh, this term serves as a similar form of the intrinsic reward exploration literature, but we are deriving from like a very different uh, design principle. We define, we derive from the like uh, IDS principle with strong guarantee. And uh, for others, like uh, they have for different uh, motivations. And also like uh, if lambda is equal to zero, because our final policy is based on the mean MDP plus um, R prime, if lambda equal to zero, this R prime equal to the standard, like a original reward function. This is like a at least for this is called like a certainty equivalent model in the Bayesian uh, RL literature. And it's going to like uh, uh, approximate the best optimal uh, solutions, right? And we have multiple interpretation now here. And they're very interesting, like uh, the eventual form of the algorithm uh, has a similar like a form here. And now you can see like uh, this algorithm actually can be implementable now. Uh, can be implemented now. And uh, actually I have implemented this algorithm for some simple tabular MDP environment. For example, for this like a reverse theme and a chain MDP. And I compare with the PSRL, this like a posterior sampling. And we use the same like a prior for a deliciate prior for the MDP. And you can see if I carefully like uh, for multiple like a uh, tries of the uh, tuning parameter, and uh, it shows like a comparable performance for like a PSRL, but this needs like a further uh, investigation. And it, it's a little bit like a sensitive to the choice of the uh, lambda. And a warning here is like a, for the current theory, we choose lambda to be scruta L times the like a scruta L of order scruta L. That means like a, here we, we show that this regularized IDS enjoy the same regret bound for vanilla IDS by setting the lambda of order scrutta L. That means in the worst case, I cannot like uh, for this screw T type of regret bound uh, is optimal. But as you know that for some easy instance, some sampling may have like a log T regret bound. But uh, if you set lambda to be scrutta, the scrutta L, you can never achieve log T regret for some easy instance. This is a limitation of the uh, theorem at this moment. I hope like uh, we can adaptively choose Lambda like in an online fashion. Okay. So this idea of boosting R with a uh, coefficient times the variance starts to look a lot like UCRL. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you know UCRL? Yeah, I know. Yeah. It starts to look a lot like UCRO in flavor. I'm wondering if I mean put the uh, bonus yeah. for the reward yeah. point. A uh, UCRO is to construct a, a bonus for the estimation for the transition dynamic, right? It's not like uh, to put the 
uh, bonus for the reward formula, right? So this is a bonus based on the variance in the transition that you take. Yes, correct. Yes. Got it. So, but but in, the, in, in the backup, they use here, all that you, you just need some bonus that you back up when there's uncertainty in the transition that you take. Uh, yes, yes. So wouldn't this have a similar effect? But our transition dynamic here is the mean MDP. I think that this value is very different from UCRL, right? Oh, but maybe in the frequency is the setting. Uh, this one is uh, close to the just the estimation standard mean estimation. I haven't been thinking about this relationship so far. I'm just curious if the UCRL type analysis would also go through for this algorithm. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Question. Sure. Um, one of the questions was that, but for the lower bound efficient computation, yes, we, wouldn't we require exponential number of samples? This require exponential numbers of samples. Uh, then that's what they're asking. Okay, I think uh, I think we can just uh, focus on on uh, our clients new like. Uh, augmented reward function, and I believe it also enjoys the same regret bound as the uh, one with the uh, this KL term, with the KL term, yes. I think you're asking if we can compute the variance with uh, fast. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, how to how fast we can, I can approximate this variance term? Right. Uh, does this require exponential? I think uh, okay. I at this moment uh, I have I don't have much idea like uh, how the approximation error can play a role in the regret guarantee because for like uh, the conjugate prior we have the closed form solution for the variance term. Yes. Thanks. Um, any other questions? Sure. One more question in the chat. Um, for the environments in figure one, mm -hmm. what are the values of lambda that enjoy the same regret bound? Uh, here I choose lambda to be 0. 0.1 times square to L because in the theory we suggest that the lambda should scale as like a square to L. L is the numbers of episodes. Then I just uh, try different like a hyperparameter here. 1.5 and 1 here. Okay. Uh, so if there are no further questions, I think uh, they're almost end. And uh, there, I just highlight some like uh, future directions like uh, in my mind. I think the first uh, is of great uh, interest to investigate if IBS or vanilla PSRL can achieve this optimal uh, Bayesian regret bound for tether MDPs. I think it's very interesting. Like uh, nowadays, people develop like a uh, multiple general complexity measures for reinforcement learning. But as far as I know, like uh, none of them can be uh, optimal, minimax optimal for tabular MDPs. So I'm not sure. Like uh, this is due to the analysis or due to like uh, there are some fundamental limitation for those like uh, complexity measures. And second one is like, uh, can we find some like an uh, interesting RL problem such that the IBS can outperform like a standard like a UCB or pump sampling principle? And the last one is to like uh, extend this like uh, analysis for like a uh, richer rich class of like a uh, RL problem. I think uh, this is also like uh, very very interesting. And also like uh, to relax the independent prior assumptions is also very in, in important because as you know like. Uh, some people use the information as theoretical analysis to analyze the adversarial sightings. They use something called like a minimax duality theorem to translate the result from the Bayesian regret to the adversarial regret. But here, once we have this like a independent prior assumptions, we cannot use the minimax duality theorem anymore. And this is also a limitation and we hope to relax this in the future. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all, thank you. This is related to the non-independent prior. You mentioned along the way uh, in your talk uh, in, pass in passing that uh, you could use a rate distortion concept to develop a theory for 
linear MVPs. Yes, correct. Uh, have you actually done that? Yeah, you're right. Yes. Okay, you have a paper on that? I think in the same paper. Same paper. Okay. Yes. Um, so for any function learning, we can just uh, idea of method and have those instant dependent or instant optimal kind of um, guarantee with great algorithm. Yeah, this is a, a great question. I think uh, because let's move back to the bandy setting. I think uh, uh, Tor, I think all they have a paper to show that ideas could be ontologically optimal, instance dependent on ontologically optimal for linear bandy settings. Right. And uh, then, like uh, I believe, like uh, you can also have like a, a similar uh, phenomena for the full reinforcement learning setting. But for Bayesian setting, it's a little bit like a hard. I mean. It's not clear like uh, what is the instance dependent uh, uh, optimality under like a uh, Bayesian setting here. Yes. Thank you. So what do you need to have Um, no. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much.